Welcome back. Thanks for being part of Organized Chaos. Uh, we are foregoing happy hour today to spend a lot of great time and uh, listen in on an incredible conversation with our own Katie Cornfield and Billy Ray. So let's check out Zoom and see what they're up to. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Hi, Billy. Good to see you. Good to see you again, too. Thank you for joining us. So, I, thank you. I know we know how busy you are with everything, with all your projects you're working on, with the upcoming elections. So, on behalf of MBTF, thank you for joining us today. It really means a lot to everyone and all of our residents. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Well, I want to get started by asking you to tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the project. Well, I had a lot to say about the Trump administration and the Trump presidency, and I was looking for the right vehicle to do it. And one night I got a call from a producer named Shane Salerno, and he said, would you like to adapt James Comey's book? And I said, get it to me immediately. This was the night before it was published. So he got me the book, and I read it overnight. And I called him the next morning, and I said, I'm in. Um, it felt like the perfect vehicle, the perfect jumping off point to make a comment about something that had really been bothering me. You know, the, the president uh, talks about what he calls the deep state, which I think is a, a horrible mischaracterization of a bunch of people that are actually public servants who, who care deeply about their country and mm -hmm. our democracy and the apolitical intentions of the institutions that make that democracy possible. And this was a chance to talk about them and to tip my cap to them, so I took it. Now, this movie is filled with some of the most brilliant character actors who all give amazing performances. Congratulations. Um, to know, and I think some of our residents would like to know, um, did you have this dream cast in mind when you were writing the script, or did you have to endure rounds of casting in order to find your incredible team of actors? Well, when you're writing a true story, uh, you picture the real people. So as I was writing Comey, I was picturing Comey, and as I was writing Trump, I was picturing Trump. And then once the script is finished, then it's time to start talking about who can play these people. Um, Jeff Daniels was always our first choice for Comey for a, a host of reasons. I needed someone who was a great actor, so he checks that box. Um, I needed someone who could physically look like Comey. Uh, Jeff is not 6'8", but he's 6'3", which was close enough. And I needed someone who had instant credibility. Because Comey is such a polarizing figure, I wanted someone that I knew America liked. And then the most important factor for me, um, because Trump is the bells and whistles part in this show, um, mm -hmm. you know, Trump gets all the fireworks. I needed an actor who was going to play Comey who would have enough confidence in their stillness, in their, in their quietude, to know that they'd be as powerful saying nothing as Trump would be flowing up fireworks. And, and Jeff gives you that. Now, you do an excellent job at laying out the complexities of Hillary Clinton's use of a private email service. And then with that, the enormous challenges and tough decisions faced by Comey and his team. And, you know, when I was watching the movie, I thought some of the most compelling and informative dialogue comes from that, those internal conversations that Comey had with his team of agents. How much of that was creative license versus you doing research and speaking with uh, the people portrayed in this story? Uh, you know, it's, all it's, so all yeah. it's all a result of research. Um, and, you know, it's not all of it is public avail publicly available, mm -hmm. but some of it was. Some of it appeared in the IG report uh, from the Department of Justice. Most of it was really just going and talking to people and interviewing people in the FBI and the DOJ, you know, as if I were a journalist, which I'm not. Um, and then, of course, you have to compress events. You have to take three conversations and put them into one scene, and, and you have to make them dramatic. But what I found was, um, because every character in there was played by such a great actor, and because every character in there had so much at stake in every scene, none of the scenes felt like a dry recitation of information. They all felt really charged. Um, I was a very, very lucky director in that sense. Now, I imagine one of the challenges of making the Comey rule is that you're charged with accurately telling a story about a critical moment in our nation's history, one that's honestly, I mean, it's still evolving and we're still sure. keeping the impact of it. So my final question before I open it up to members of our audience and our residents is twofold. 
One is, what has the response been from Comey and perhaps some of the other people portrayed in the movie? And two, what response are you hoping to achieve from your audience? Well, the response from Comey has been great. Uh, he's very, very proud of the movie, and he's very, very glad that he uh, acceded to my wishes and, and, um, and allowed us to make it. Uh, you know, what I wanted to do was really simple. Um, everybody experienced 2016, and everybody believes that they know what happened in that election. But their experience of that is based on which lens they were looking through. If you were watching Fox News or listening to Sinclair Radio, you had one experience of the 2016 election. If you were watching MSNBC or CNN, you had a very different experience of that election. But everybody believes they know what happened. This was a chance, I thought, to take people inside the rooms that they didn't have access to and really see what happened at the FBI and the DOJ and the White House as these conversations that impacted us all so profoundly actually took place. And the attempt was to say to the audience, okay, be Jim Comey for five minutes. Here are the facts on the ground. Here are the pressures he was facing. Here are the constraints. Here are the political realities. What would you do? And that's not an attempt to apologize for Jim Comey. It's an attempt to explore the decision-making process that led to some of those momentous uh, choices that he made. And what has been gratifying for me is that people are reevaluating him and reevaluating that period in American history. They're taking a much more serious and sober look at what the Russians did to our election in 2016, which is not a matter of conjecture. It's absolutely a matter of fact. They're trying it again in 2020. That is also not a matter of conjecture. Um, I think people, you know, look, it wasn't my job to educate them. I'm not a documentary filmmaker. It was my job to move them. Um, but I do think people are coming away with a different perspective of the 2016 election, and that's hugely gratifying for me. Well, thank you, Billy. I want to bring back in MBTF's Jennifer Clymer. She's going to help us field some questions from the residents. Jen? Hello. Hello. Um, Hi. So, yeah, the phone lines are open right now. You can call us at 1221. I do want to address a question that was um, issued over the webinar. Um, would you talk for a moment about the generosity of Showtime and what they were able to do for the campus, for the residents? Do you, are you even well, aware of this? I was not aware of this, so you have to educate me. Um, we were given the uh, first, the episode, the two episodes to play on 1390 for residents that um, can't afford or don't have Showtime. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's perfect. That makes me really, really happy. Um, you know, I want smart people who care about their country to watch this. And uh, that applies to everybody who's on this Zoom right now. Um, uh, you know, I, I've made a lot of movies about my country before. This is the first time I ever made a movie for my country, um, which means that I made it for all of you. And I'm, I'm thrilled that Showtime made that possible. Um, I had the opportunity to watch it over the weekend, and I have to say, it is so well made, and it really does give an opportunity to, like you said, put, put yourself in Comey's shoes. For me, the way you were able to um, kind of touch into the female point of view through his wife and his daughters, um, mm -hmm. It, it reignited an anger in me that I thought I had squelched, <laughs> that I thought I'd put down. Um, but I, I have to think that that's intentional, that you, as the director, you wanted to kind of hit that touchstone again for people to say, remember, <laughs> let's not have that happen again. Well, it actually, that wasn't it. It, it was, I wanted to tell a story about how heartbreaking it can be to be a public servant. Again, that idea, those people that President Trump calls the deep state, they are public servants. Right. And their job is incredibly complicated. And part of the complication is they have to go home every night. And they have families. And their families have a point of view about what they're doing. 
Um, you know, they're making decisions that are profoundly affecting everybody in America, including the people in their own house. And so it seemed really important to me to follow Comey home and to see what that dynamic was like. Also, um, his wife, Patrice, who's pretty extraordinary, she is a partner to him. I mean, they are they are 50-50 in everything. He has incredible regard for her. Um, you know, I, I before I started writing, I sent him a 150 question questionnaire just to sort of get to know him a little bit. And one of the questions I asked him was, do you fight with your family in the same way that you might fight at the FBI? Do you talk to your family in the same way that you talk to the FBI? Do you ever lose your temper and raise your voice? And Comey wrote back to me, Patrice says that I yelled at her once when we were dating when I was 21, and she told me not to do it again, and I have. Well, that told me a lot about James Comey yeah. and how he feels about his wife. And yes, she's a very big deal in the story because she's a very big deal in his life. And you do such a beautiful job to illustrate that in the um, the cancer sessions mm -hmm. where you don't hit that really hard on the head. It's just like this is something that was part of their lives and this is how they dealt with it. Um, and by the way, you know, he wrote uh, that book. He wrote uh, A Higher Loyalty, which is more a memoir than an autobiography, but um, he left the cancer out of the book. Really? And I, asked, and I asked him why. He said, well, the book was really about leadership and the cancer had nothing to do with that. Who the hell would write a story about their life and leave out something like, I had a colorectal cancer. You know, Comey once uh, testified, I think it was in 2006, testified uh, before a Senate subcommittee with a colostomy bag. Um, it's pretty extraordinary. And he never told anybody, ever. That's, that's very much who that guy is. In the, in the same way that it's very James Comey uh, on July 4th to gather his entire family around in a circle and to read the Declaration of Independence aloud to one another. Um, you know, that's who Comey is. The other thing about Comey, which I couldn't fit into the movie, is uh, I found out he watches This Is Us every week and cries during every episode. Uh, I couldn't figure out a way to, to, to jam that into the narrative, but it's true. Um, do, you, do you think that that is a choice that he makes or he wants to bond with his four daughters and that's a really wonderful way to do it? I, I think he's uh, a very sensitive, decent man, uh, completely actualized and, and dimensionalized. Um, I, 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 this guy had two years of working with me in which he never once tried to manipulate me or spin me or steer me into creating a more uh, flattering version of him than I had. He saw a uh, draft of the script. He saw cuts of the movie. Never once did I get a note saying, boy, I really look like a jerk here. Could you help me? Or boy, I really don't like the way they're talking about me here. Could you cut it? Who would have that kind of restraint? I wouldn't. Um, I would be manipulating the heck out of a filmmaker if they were making a movie about me. Um, but he didn't do that. He thought I would play fair with him. He thought I would tell the truth. That was enough. And uh, that, that says a lot about him. So there was no pushback about the showboat? Because that, no. that gets hit a couple of times as well. None. I, I, the only, uh, the, the closest to that was, there was, uh, there's a line in the script where, uh, in which Mark Giuliano, who was his first deputy director, in reference to him, says, as smart as he is, his political instincts are not good. And Comey read that scene and wrote me an email saying, I think my political instincts are good. And I wrote back to him saying, your political instincts are horrible. And it was, <laughs> it was never mentioned again. Um, <laughs> he's great that way, he's great. Um, I, again, I offer anyone who's watching, call us at 1221. You can ask Billy any question that you've got, including his incredible connections to MPTF and the long roots of family history in the entertainment industry. Um, oh, Kong one, has a question. Story, one other story about uh, Mark Giuliano, who's the guy I was just referring to, Comey's first uh, deputy director. Um, Mark Giuliano lives in Atlanta 
and his wife didn't want him to take the job because he'd be in D.C. And, and but Mark took it because Comey asked him to. And uh, and then Mark, who was going to leave after eight months, Comey talked him into staying another six months. There's a scene about that. In the twenty-four show. months. I just give me twenty-four I, I, months. 20, okay. So to thank Giuliano's wife, Comey sent her an FBI Christmas ornament, a ball, because he knew that she collected Christmas ornaments. And then he flew down to Atlanta to see her personally, to say thank you. And it turns out that she had taken the Christmas ornament and baked it into a cheesecake, which she then served to him when he came to the house. That's, that's the story of Judy Giuliano. Question. We we all know and love Hawk Koch. Here he is. Hi, Hawk. Hi. Hi, Jen. Hi, Hawk. Hi, Hi. Katie. Hi, Billy. Hi. I had a How question. You? Did you did you speak with uh, Clapper and Brennan? Uh, and what did they have you spoken with them since the show? They've seen the show. Um, I didn't speak to Brennan. I spoke to Clapper, uh, who is incredible and who uh, who, who Comey really adores. And it was Clapper who actually set me straight on something that I had a fundamental misunderstanding of. Um, I really believed that it was Comey who had inadvertently tipped the election to Trump. And it was Clapper who would know. He was the head of the direct, he was the director of national intelligence. Uh, Clapper said, no, the deciding uh, factor in 2016 was the Russians. Their, their interference in our election was absolutely what tipped the election to Trump. And they're trying to do it again in 2020. Um, and Clapper has been great since uh, the movie has aired. He's been um, incredibly supportive. And, and, you know, what a treat for me, what a privilege to be able to email Clapper and say, hey, what do you think about this? What's your read on this? And he tells me um, to the extent that he can. Um, so there's also a moment um, that I feel is very even handed in um, I, I want to say it's part one, where um, all of the, the text messages between Lisa mm -hmm. and that's all done over just these intimate scenes at a hotel, and it's very clear that it, it's an affair that's being had. And um, But some of the, the information, that content, that gets shared face-to-face -face instead of over text message um, does deal very directly with no, it, there were so many factors that made this election, you know, made it that Trump won over Hillary. Um, and you can't just rely upon or put the finger on one thing. It was a, a perfect storm to. Well, that's exact, exactly right. Um, here are the factors that, that Donald Trump uh, rode to victory, okay? Yeah, of course, Comey wrote that letter. That was impactful. He also uh, had the very good fortune to be following the first African-American president in history in a fundamentally racist country. That was a pretty big break. He got to run against Hillary Clinton, who I think would have been a great president, but was a terrible candidate on a million different levels, just a horrible campaigner. And everything stuck to her. Um, that was a pretty enormous break. Um, he also had decisively uh, the Russians working for him in every way possible. Um, in a year in which 137 million Americans voted, 126 million Americans were exposed to disinformation just on Facebook, forgetting what they did uh, on Instagram or fake Twitter handles or all the rest of it. I'm talking about um, 126 million people who saw disinformation pumped into Facebook by the Russians, thinking that it was coming from fellow Americans. They were. They were putting up fake Hillary rallies and then canceling them. They were creating all sorts of discord. There were all kinds of American impersonators running around out there. It was uh, a very, very well-coordinated attack that it turns out the Trump campaign knew all about and did what it could to help. Um, you know, that's, that's putting your finger on the scale. Um, the other thing that, that he benefited from is that in the state of Michigan, um, on election day 2016, there were 87,000 ballots cast that had a Democrat listed for representative, state senate, and state house, but left the top line blank. 87,000 Democrats, Democrats just in Michigan, voted Democrat straight down the ticket 
and did not vote for Hillary. Didn't vote for Trump, but just left it blank. 87,000 Democrats in a state she lost by 11,000 votes. That's pretty extraordinary, too. When I say that she was a bad candidate, I mean stuff like that. Right. Um, in every way possible that this could have broken right for Trump, it did. There's a group of people called Hold Your Nose voters, which are uh, people who just don't like either candidate. In 2016, they broke overwhelmingly for Trump. In 2020, what we're seeing is they are breaking overwhelmingly for Biden. And that's a huge difference. You know, you work so closely with Comey during this whole process. You know, the yes. research, writing, shooting. It, along those lines, was there, any, was there ever the moment when he thought, oh, I should have done this differently? Like, did he ever reveal, maybe I should have handled something differently along the way? Now that Never. he's sort of seen the way you've depicted it, did Never. he ever think, oh, maybe I should have gone up there with Sally Yates? He just stands by what he did and that he made the right decision at the time. I think he regrets the results uh, deeply. Mm -hmm. And I think you can take him at his word when he says he is mildly nauseated by the idea that he might have impacted those results. But I, I think he feels that, um, that the process by which he made those decisions was so pure that he can't second guess it. And look, that's part of what makes him fascinating as a character. That's part of what makes him so Shakespearean is that he has such a belief in his moral compass and in his true north that nothing can shake him of it. Um, that I find really compelling and, and really fascinating. And, you know, I wanted to see what the dy dynamics would be if you put him in a room with Donald Trump, just dramatically, what would that, what would that look like? You know, um, one of the movies that we talked about a lot when we were on set is Rain Man. And the reason we talked about Rain Man is because the basic dramatic tension in Rain Man is, here's Tom Cruise who can charm anybody, right? Talk anybody into anything. And he runs into a guy who, because he's autistic, can't be charmed and can't be talked into anything. And it's a, the entire movie is Tom Cruise saying, how do I do this? Like, none of my usual tools are working. And that friction is the whole movie. Well, it seemed to me we were going to have that here, too. Comey believes that his decency is such that he can ennoble anybody he's in a room with. And Trump believes he can corrupt or bully anybody he's in a room with. And they're both wrong. Well, I, I Comey was, was going to say they're Comey both Tom Cruise. That's right. Comey can't change Trump, and Trump can't change Comey. And so it's they're in 10 scenes together, and it's a 10-round boxing match. And, and that's how I talked about it with the actors all day long. It would be going up to Brendan and saying, whatever you do, bully him. And going up to Jeff Daniels and say, whatever you do, don't get bullied. And then action. And then off they go. And, and that was the basic dynamic between the two. You got some incredible performances out of them. Just incredible. Oh, they're great actors. I, I've never seen either of them be bad in anything. So thank you. But I don't know how much credit I can take for it. But, but the point I want to make about that is it could have very quickly fallen into caricature. Yes. And it, it, it does not. Well, we knew we were doing the first dramatic interpretation ever of Donald Trump. Um, I love Alec Baldwin, but, you know, we weren't doing a sketch. We were doing something very different. Right. And that brought with it a certain level of responsibility. So for me, that meant um, we couldn't do it as a caricature, even though in his normal behavior, he can be a caricature. Right. So our hair was going to be a little better than his. Our, our makeup was going to be a little less cartoonish than his. Our, our suits were going to fit Brendan a little better than Trump's suits do. We weren't going to do a joke voice. We were going to let his actions define him. We were going to let we were going to put his behavior out in front of the American people and say, "You guys decide." And and Brendan was very very game for that. Brendan never once came up to me and said, "Can I be more villainous here? Can I be more mustache twirly?" He just doesn't think that way. We played him as uh, as you'd play any character. What does the character want? How's the character trying to get it? That's all we talked about. I want to say I loved seeing Holly Hunter again, too, in this movie. When she comes on screen as Sally Yates, I thought, yes, that's perfect cast. I mean, brilliant casting. And so did you, did, was that a direct relationship? Did you call her and say, I want you to be in my movie? Or it's just so refreshing to see her. And that was, she did such a, a fabulous job. I had never met her before. Uh, the second the script was done, it became really clear that nobody could play Sally Yates except Holly Hunter. And thank God she said yes. 
Um, you know, Brendan uh, turned down the part of Trump the first time we offered it to him. And, um, you know, there was about a month or a month or two in the wilderness where Jeff Daniels and I were looking at lists saying, who else can play Trump? Because Brendan seemed so perfect for it. And I had a great casting director uh, named Sharon Bialy, and she stayed on top of Brendan's team. She kept calling Brendan's manager saying, he should do this. He really should do this. And I don't know, she wore him down, and eventually he, he changed his mind. Uh, but he was what one was of the... What was that? the reason he didn't want to do it, Billy? Originally. Um, okay, if you're Brendan Gleeson, if you're Brendan Gleeson and you're living happily in Dublin, right, bothering <laughs> nobody, why on earth would you want to come do this, right? Why would you take on a guy who, in Donald Trump, does not exactly handle criticism with a lot of grace. Um, you know you're going to get a mean nickname. You know you're just going to get torpedoed at some point. Why invite that upon yourself? So the agreement that we made was he would do the part, but he didn't have to do any press uh, afterwards. He didn't want to bring any attention upon himself after uh, playing the role, and that was fine with me. Well, he'll probably get some more attention at Emmy time. Or that would be okay Or at Golden Globe. That would also be okay with me. Um, you know, uh, we're not supposed to care about that stuff. Uh, I do. I, I care desperately about it. And the reason that I care about it is because um, when I think about who my idols were, uh, not just when I first started writing, but all through my career, when I think about, you know, Alvin Sargent or William Goldman or Patty Chayefsky or, you know, George Roy Hill or, you know, any of them, uh, Pakula, when I think about those greats, um, the only way to measure their ability is awards. I'm sorry, I know it's the dumbest yardstick in the world, but, you know, Alvin Sargent won two Oscars, and so did Bill Goldman, and, and so did Bo Goldman, and, uh, and Chayefsky won three. Um, you know, i got a lot of work to do if I want to catch up to those guys. Those are the people that I want to be measured against. And uh, as silly as it sounds, awards are one of the ways that you get there. So, yeah, that stuff matters to me deeply. Also, I think my actors are so brilliant. I want them to get the credit they deserve. I want them to have that night of glory, even if it's a virtual one. Um, they deserve it. Can so I, I even? Yeah, oh, I was going to say all of us. We're Mike. so excited. Yeah, we're all, we love the cast. <laughs> but Michael Kelly is another one that he makes Andy McCabe's so likable. I mean, and it's the little subtleties that he that he offers in the film, his his disposition, his mannerism. But as a viewer, I thought. Andy McCabe is a good guy. I like him. He's a hardworking guy. Did mm -hmm. you have any correspondence with him throughout making the movie? I did, I, and I, I sat face to face with him, as did Michael, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know Andy, and I think Andy's a friend, and I think Andy's a misunderstood guy, and I think he is actually a great guy. But the thing about Michael Kelly is, first of all, he's a brilliant actor. So right. we'll start with that as sort of the, the, the baseline. <laughs> but you can give him the tiniest piece of direction and he can extrapolate from, from that place at the performance of an entire scene. There's a scene at the end of night two where Michael Kelly sort of takes over the FBI and essentially announces to the staff, our, our investigation is going to expand to include the president himself, right? There's a ton of dialogue. It was, you know, a lot of information that had to be conveyed in that scene. But all you're trying to do when you direct is get to the emotional truth of the scene. That's what, that's what the actors are playing. So what we did was we started him at the far end of the table because there's a chair that James Comey always sat in as the head of the FBI. And I said, what the scene is about is at the beginning of the scene, you don't think you belong in that chair. So you're at the other end of the table. And by the time the scene's over, you are ready to sit in Jim Comey's chair and say, let's begin. That's the whole scene. Forget the dialogue. The dialogue's going to happen. You just play the emotional reality of going from one end of the table to the other. And he did it. And it's his best scene in the movie. That's pretty simple direction. But out of it came this entire performance. And when you have a great actor, that's what happens. And that's why Billy's the director that he is, because <laughs> having worked with some of the people you mentioned before, Billy, that's what they were able to do with a little piece of direction to get what they wanted. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We all know it's a collaborative art form and there are lots of people on your team. Um, one of the things that I have loved in the buildup to this uh, was the art direction specifically around the dinner. 
the the mm -hmm. moment that everyone had heard about and it as soon as it broke in the news i'm sure all of us had a picture of what that looked like um did you get the specifics of that kind of small round table that they were one-on-one -on -one from Comey, or is that fictionalized for the... For no, that, that's very real. My production designer, his name is Chris Brown, he's a genius, and that room was built to the exact dimensions of, uh, of the actual green room, and it's decorated like the green room is, and it's situated like the green room is. Um, what I felt was really important there was that by the end of that dinner, you should feel like Comey and Trump are on an island. Um, so what we did was, uh, as as Comey and Trump enter the room, uh, the room the table is lit from, from over above. the top. Yeah. Uh, but there are also lights on the walls and lamps behind them. And for, and the second that uh, Donald Trump says, "I need loyalty." we began to slowly kill all the other lights in the room. We killed the lights on the walls and we killed the lamps, but we did it over the course of five minutes. So you would never ever be able to perceive it. Uh, you can do that when you have a scene that's eight and a half minutes long. Um, so that by the end, without you knowing it, every other light in the room is off, except this light right over the top of them. So you really feel like they are alone in a sea of darkness and they're just on an island and there's nothing there except the other person. And I wanted to isolate them in that way. Um, having a room that was exactly the right dimensions made that possible. Having an incredible gaffer, uh, just a great team of technicians made that possible. And then of course you needed actors who wouldn't be distracted by it. Um, and and you know I, I didn't tell them that was coming until the second before I said action. Uh, literally I said to them, hey, after he says, um, I need loyalty. These lights are going to start dimming. Just go with it. And uh, you'd never seen their performance that they noticed it. I'm not sure that they actually did. By the way, that scene um, was the only scene in our shoot that got its own shooting day. We were shooting two movies in 51 days, which as Hawk can tell you is fast. It's faster than I've ever had to move before. Uh -huh. So we were shooting four or five scenes every single day. Uh, but the loyalty dinner, because it was eight and a half pages, got its own day. Uh, which was a great luxury on a movie like ours. It was the first day Jeff Daniels and Brendan Gleeson were working opposite each other, uh, which was pretty incredible. They met in the trailer that morning. Um, and it was the only day James Comey was on set. He showed up with one of his daughters, uh, uh, arranged by me. I, thought, I said, if you're going to be here for one day, you got to be here for the loyalty dinner. So imagine if you're uh, Jeff Daniels, right? You've got eight and a half minutes, eight and a half minute scene, no rehearsal. Your first day opposite Brendan Gleeson, and he is bringing it with the bells and whistles. And James Comey, who you're playing, is sitting over your shoulder watching a monitor. As a degree of difficulty, I'd give it about a 9.9. .9. And Jeff Daniels absolutely crushed. Just a great performance in that scene. I, I love that scene. Yeah, it's... Um, you do get the sense that the walls are closing in. Um, and to do it in that way so subtly brilliant just brilliant well, thank you, thank you. Um, i had some smart people around me was there ever a moment when you were writing this that you were thinking um i i have to direct this like that's part of the deal never it's like this is mine no actually um uh, i wrote it thinking that we would go to somebody else and we did we had a, a big time director uh, initially who was going to do this and that director bailed and uh, and at that moment my producer Shane Salerno said you should do it and so I started thinking about it in those terms and um, and wound up crafting it into something that I thought I was capable of directing uh, you know it didn't have things in there that I know I don't know how to do uh, but the things in there I thought I could do and I, I surrounded myself with a team of people that made that possible now I'm very curious as to what you think you can't do. Uh, Jurassic Park. <laughs> uh, you know, there are all kinds of things I don't think I can do. I don't think I can do Fast and Furious. Oh, uh, so no, no, chase, no French Connection chase have, scenes? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I could have directed Platoon. I don't think I could have directed Ben-Hur. Uh, Sound of Music, West Side Story, should I go on? No, that's um, okay. 
I think I think I have a, a limited set of visual skills, and um, and within those visual skills, I, I think I know how to express myself. Uh, but outside that, I just think there are a lot of people who can do it better. I mean, you know, when I wrote Captain Phillips, um, it never occurred to me to direct it because I knew just off the top of my head I could name twenty people who were a better idea. Yeah, and but you could have directed To Kill a Mockingbird, and you could have directed, and you could have directed. Uh, uh, a little movie about Nixon uh, starring Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford. Um, I, I, okay, thank you. That's, <laughs> that's very kind of you. I hope you're right. Let me put it this way. If, some, if, if someone gave me the opportunity to, to write and direct all the president's men, yes, I would, I would take that on, for sure. For sure. But if someone gave me the opportunity to direct uh, Almost anything else ever, <laughs> uh, you know, Amadeus. Um, I would say no because I just think there are other people who would be better at it. I think, um, I think, I think very narrowly uh, in terms of, of how I uh, envision a scene, and that particular bent of mine seems to translate pretty well. Excuse me to stories like this. I. I picture um, that kind of quiet persistence that there, I, I think To Kill a Mockingbird is a really good example of, of kind of tone, like this is Billy Ray, that it's, it's that um, stand up guy who is doing the right thing, you know? Well, it seems like um, a lot of the movies that I make, they seem to be about um, moral ambiguity that gives way to moral clarity, and then, okay, what do you do about it? Um, that seems to be what I like to write about. I seem to like writing about integrity, um, and I like writing about American institutions. They really fascinate me. Um, I think part of that is because I, I, I suspect, as a country, we really misunderstand them, and by that I mean we think about the FBI as an institution when, of course, it's not. The FBI is a group of people who are stewards of an institution. Mm -hmm. But it's not the building that makes those decisions, right? It's the people inside uh, the building. And if you want an example of that, take a look at our post office. It's a very different thing run by Louis DeJoy than it would be if it were run by an actual human being who cared about people getting their mail on time. Um, the Department of Justice, a very different animal run by Bill Barr, who is an absolute political hack, who just wants the Department of Justice to be a, a wing and a weapon of the White House, obviously very different place when it's run by Janet Reno or, or Eric Holder. Um, like I said, it's the people inside the buildings who make the decisions, and, and the way that they do that is very compelling to me. So there could be all the president's men, too, just under the title Rage, right? Is that, is that the next set yes. of tapes? Uh, it's really hard to know. Uh, uh, boy, I, I personally believe as a country, we are going to be unpacking these four years for uh, a generation to come. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to equate it to uh, uh, Nazism in, in Hitler's Germany, but, in this, but I do mean that in the same way that Germany will never stop looking at that period of time and never stop that, that self-examination because it's so necessary to understand why they allowed that to happen. I believe that, although it is not the same thing, I believe that America will have to look at these four years for a long time to come and say, why did we allow this to happen to our democracy? What does that say about us? And I think it says a lot. Um, and what are we going to do about this? so that we never uh, get sucked into something like this again. Um, I'm happy to be a part of that conversation. I'm, I'm really, really proud that from now on, uh, when people say, what happened with Jim Comey and Donald Trump, will be the movie that they think of, will be the frame of reference. In the same way that if you ask an American, what happened on Apollo 13, you think of Ron Howard's movie. You just can't help it. Right. Um, film can do that, it has that kind of power. And I, I really, really hope that we become a part of that conversation. So in the last couple of minutes that we have, um, mm -hmm. given that Hawk is here and uh, we are at the Motion Picture and Television Fund campus, I'd love to shift the conversation slightly to your volunteerism, your connections to MPTF, um, 
and not just your volunteerism for care calls and, and the things that you've been doing safely from home, but also your outreach. You did some incredible things right away that galvanized people and got them pointed and focused to supporting MPTF. Well, thank you. Um, uh, my connection to MPTF uh, goes way back. My grandmother was there. Um, uh, it's gonna sound like I'm bragging and I don't mean it to sound that way, but um, my great uncle was George Burns. Um, and his brother, Willie, for whom I was named, uh, Willie was one of his producers and head writers, and, and Willie was married to my grandmother, Louise. So my grandmother, Louise, uh, wound up uh, being a resident at MPTF and received incredible care there. And I felt a debt to that place. So when MPTF asks, uh, you know, the answer is always yes. And that means if they need me to write something for them when they do their real lives, uh, I'm going to go do that. And uh, what happened in this particular case was at the at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, MPTF reached out. They were running out of some things, and there was a little bit of a, a money crisis. And I reached out to a list of donors uh, that I had been curating uh, for the last couple of years and said, this is what MPTF needs. And that list came through in a really spectacular way. Um, and headed off a crisis. And it had more to do with their generosity than my outreach. Um, you know, I was a facilitator, but it was it was those people that did the incredible work. Um, and then care calls, you know, care calls are easy. Um, I have a list of, I think, six people that I call, you know, weekly or, or bi-weekly and, and um, just see how they're doing. And it's, it's really simple. It's just, hi, this is Billy. I'm calling on behalf of MPTF. Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything MPTF can do for you? And you know, the conversations are usually really short. Um, every once in a while, they'll tell me what's going on. One of them fell and hurt her arm. One of them has a daughter who's diabetic. And one of them has a, a manager of, of her apartment who shops for her. And another one is a three-time cancer survivor and, and is thinking about moving uh, to the Imperial Valley. Like, you know, you just get into conversations about what's going on with them. And, uh, and they feel a little more cared for, which is the point. You do an incredible job of um hearing people thank you yeah <laughs> thank you thanks for being on billy thank you billy